Good evening. Namaste. Jai Guru, everybody. Welcome to today evening's class on Jesus Christ, his life and his teachings. As always, let us begin the class with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lehri Mahashay, Swami Sri Yukteswar Ji, Beloved Gurudev, Paramhansa Yogananda Ji, Friend and Guide, Swami Kriyananda Ji, Saints and Sages of all religions, humbly we bow at thy feet. Dear Lord, make my heart big enough to hold thee, that it throb with the Christ consciousness in everything. Then shall I enjoy thy birth in my heart, in my mind, in my soul, and in oneness with every pulsing atom. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Let's invoke the presence of the Gurus by singing the hymn to Brahma, followed by the chant, Door of My Heart. It's Christmas time, my friends. Let us open our hearts and lovingly invite Jesus into our life.
Just take a few moments of silence. And in this silence, let us inwardly open the door of our heart. Offering the love of our heart, surrendering our life to God, and raising the energy to the spiritual eye to meet Christ there. Let us energetically, enthusiastically, willingly look towards God, move towards Him and be one with Him at the point between the eyebrows, the spiritual eye, the positive pole of the Agya Chakra. That is where Christ is waiting for us. Concentrate all your energy, focus your entire attention, gaze upwards, look deep into the space behind your spiritual eye, enter into that space, relax into that space. Once you are relaxed there, then concentrate again as if concentrating on a pinpoint of light in the spaciousness of your spiritual eye. Like a laser beam, focus your attention there. With every next incoming breath, Raise the energy in the astral spine and offer it at the spiritual eye. As we sit in silence, let us hear a few words by Swami Kriyananda on the topic of immortality. You are not your body. You are not your thoughts, your desires, your changing personality. Your body has a certain age, but you yourself have no age. Your body may tire or become unwell, but you yourself, the fatigueless soul, cannot tire, can never know disease. Tell yourself always, I am a child of eternity. Don't be identified with your outward form nor with change, but live in timelessness. It is our identity with change that creates the illusion of passing time. Feel that through all outward changes, you, the immortal soul, remain the same. Death itself will be but one more change. Be not identified with it. Then when death comes, you shall rise in eternal freedom. Let us do the following affirmation a few times. I am a child of eternity. I am ageless. I am deathless. I am the changeless spirit at the heart of all mutation. I am a child of eternity. I am ageless. 
I am deathless. I am the changeless spirit at the heart of all mutation. I am a child of eternity. I am ageless. I am deathless. I am the changeless spirit at the heart of all mutation. Mentally follow this prayer. Wherever my body travels outwardly, let me feel thy changeless presence within. Wherever my thoughts take me, let them return always to find repose in thee. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Welcome again, dear friends. And we revert back to our study of the New Testament, of which uh, we are at a very crucial point now. We are uh, at the point where the Last Supper is also done. So during uh, the Thursday evening before Good Friday, before the crucifixion of Christ, there was the Passover feast for which Jesus asked his disciples to arrange. He then shared his bread, he shared his wine and told the disciples that it was his flesh and blood, meaning that if they were in tune with him, they would always continue to feel him. And then he also mentioned about the traitor amongst them. And then he told Judas Iscariot to actually do the work quickly, whatever he was meaning to do. And uh, while Judas Iscariot goes away with the money bag to meet the scribes, in the meantime, Jesus is addressing the rest of the apostles, the disciples who are so close to him. He, in fact, by this time has personally washed the feet of each of his disciples and he is addressing them lovingly. He is calling them his friend. And he's also now mentioning that how he will not be there anymore amongst them for some time, but then he will send the comforter to them and then the comforter will reveal all things unto them. The comforter will be a confirmation that Jesus the Christ was indeed uh, the one, the son of God. And uh, he lovingly informs them. And when Peter says, where, where, where are you going? And I will come along. And Jesus says to him that you cannot come along. And Peter says, I'm definitely going to come along. But Jesus tells him that you will deny me three times before the cock crows. And eventually we will see how that also happens. So uh, the disciples are still confused as to what is going to really happen. In the meantime, Judas has gone to meet with the scribes. Jesus here knows exactly what's going to happen. And he still wants to pray to the Father. He wants to glorify God in front of his disciples and convey the message. So we let's continue with the gospel. We are reading Gospel of John chapter 17. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So Master explains these subtle statements uh, beautifully. He says, through the, so Jesus is saying what Jesus is meaning is, through the Christ consciousness in me, I have declared thy hidden glory. So the glory of the heavenly father of cosmic consciousness, definitely and tangibly to the doubting people of earth. Heavenly father, I have finished the work which thou entrusted to me for the redemption of thy true lovers. And now, O oh Father, though the limitless, through the limitless power of thy cosmic consciousness, surcharge my Christ consciousness, make it absolutely one with thy cosmic consciousness as it originally was before the cosmos and the Christ consciousness as if separated, projected from thee. So again, Jesus is going into the metaphysical and the metaphorical 
uh, truths of his being, that how he is the, the reflection of pure Christ, cosmic consciousness. And before creation came into being, the, the Holy Ghost, the Christ consciousness and cosmic consciousness were all one. And when creation was projected, the universe was created, then God the Father, that means cosmic consciousness, divided itself into Christ consciousness and the Holy Ghost and the whole drama of creation has since then played out. And then when uh, creation is withdrawn back, then again, uh, Christ consciousness and the Om vibration or the Holy Ghost will merge back into cosmic consciousness as they were. If we speak parallelly into, uh, in, in Hindi words, we know that God the Father or cosmic consciousness is the Nirgun Brahman or the one formless absolute God. One, when the one absolute stillness or still consciousness wants to create, it, re, it starts to vibrate and it starts to reflect. And then that is when uh, the Nirgun Brahman becomes the Sagun Brahman, means God with form. And for God with form to project into being, the, uh, an intelligence or Kutastha Chaitanya or Christ intelligence is required. And a medium is required in which that reflection will happen. And the Om vibration or the Holy Ghost is that medium into which Kutastha Chaitanya or reflection of God, of cosmic consciousness is projected and the whole drama is, uh, is as if a movie, as if it is projected like a movie. And uh, according to Advaita Vedanta, if we go, it is a pure, uh, it, it actually a non-existent drama. It appears to be true, but it is all illusory because it is just a projection of God's thought. But of course, uh, as long as we think that we are in this body and we are mortals, this drama is very, very real to us. It is only when we start to inquire in Atunja, is it that only the only Jesus Christ was one with Christ consciousness? Or is it true that all of us are actually part of that indivisible Christ consciousness? All of us have a body, all of us have a mind and personality, but our real nature, our real truth, uh, is the same as the truth of Jesus. That is, we are Christ consciousness at the very core. We are never separate from the infinite. And um, if, we, if we start to see things from that angle, that we are the divine light descended temporarily into flesh, then we will be able to tune ourselves better with Christ consciousness and to feel his omnipresence and his love more as compared to if you were to start just thinking that, oh, I am this poor little body and mind. So here Jesus is glorifying God again. And uh, he is saying now that my work is done. Okay, then Jesus continues in the gospel. He says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, Father, and thine are mine and I am glorified in them. But, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So now Jesus is directly praying for his disciples uh, to the Heavenly Father, and he's saying that it is the Father who has sent those souls to him, for redemption. And then he's praying that as we are one, means uh, Jesus and God the Father is one. He's requesting that God uh, uh, help and bless the, the other souls who are there to also be eventually one with him. So Master explains this beautifully. He says, I specially pray for those who are truly seeking thee, not for the worldly people who lack interest in knowing thee. Jesus humanly feels the responsibility for the attainment of his disciples during his absence. So uh, similarly, you know, when the guru comes in body and he plays a part and then he leaves, he still feels responsible for all the souls that are yet to come or even who are there when he leaves his body. So he is. The, it is the master's huge concern he lovingly wants that all should attain the same state as he has attained himself. That is oneness with the Heavenly Father. And that is why the Guru has to do so much more work than us. He has to personally attend to 
everybody in, in fact some scriptures say, say that god is our servant guru it, uh, works so much he's like our servant in the sense he's serving us he's making sure that we see the light of god that we start to move towards the light of god that we have the right thoughts and attitudes that we have the right techniques that will help us to move towards god so god and guru are doing so much for each one of us uh, that if we acknowledge that if we we would really bow down our heads in humility and uh, we would just completely surrender ourselves so uh, we must recognize this fact that the guru is always concerned for the welfare of his disciples okay he knew that after his departure satan would seize on any karmic weakness within them and use it to try to destroy their spiritual life so jesus makes the fervent plea to the father thou gave us the disciple to me they belong to thee and to me and that is why thou must protect them from the influence of evil in my absence let's continue okay, give me a moment please Yes, so the gospel continues. O righteous father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. I pray that, so Master explains, I pray that the unconditional, all-powerful, ever-intoxicating love with which thou hast loved me may be manifest in the disciples along with my Christ consciousness. So again, he is continuing to plead for the disciples who are under him. And uh, uh, Master is, talks about unconditional, all-powerful, ever-intoxicating love. Now, uh, most of us are convinced that God doesn't care about us. Many, mo most people on earth are convinced that there, many of them will say there is no God because if there is God, why is there suffering? And then the whole story will go on in a different direction. But even when we are on the path, we have many doubts as to whether lo God loves us or not. The, the very proof that avatars come to uh, earth, that the guru has come in our life, is the proof of the presence of God's love for us. And that love, the more you can give back that love, the more you will find that how intoxicating that love is, that nothing else actually really matters in front of that love. So that is, uh, we have to convince ourselves time and again, every day, that God loves us. God is on our side. He is our friend, not only our friend, he is father, mother, friend, beloved, everything. He is our savior. He is our everything. He is our very breath. He's our very heartbeat. He's the very blood that circulates in the body. He's the very thought in the mind. He's the very feeling in our heart. He is everything. He is all and all. And he can never leave us. If we are but convinced of this truth, then we shall not shed a tear uh, in little problems of life. We shall not be sorrowful. Even when big problems come, there will be a space inside of us which will know that God the Father is always present with us, in us, always and forever. Okay. So now the next uh, part of the gospel is called Jesus's agony in the garden of Gethsemane and his arrest. So we are closing down to the point where Jesus is going to be arrested. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane and saith unto his disciples, sit ye here, while I go and pray yonder. So just for a, a physical reference, so there is a garden of Gethsemane, which is uh, about, uh, let's say, uh, two two 2.5 kilometers away from the point where Jesus was uh, crucified. So the point where he was crucified uh, was, um, uh, at that time, it was the periphery of, of Jerusalem, but now it is at the center point. It is the Holy Sepulchre, the Holy Tomb, where uh, Jesus uh, is the all the shrines are there but at that time uh, the the uh, crucifixion was done at the periphery of the uh, town and there is a garden which is approximately two kilometers uh, away from that point and that place is called Gethsemane 
And uh, not only on this night, but on many nights before that, it is said that Jesus and his disciples, uh, when they wanted a quiet time amongst themselves, they would come and sit in this garden. So it's a walkable distance. And when we went to the Holy Land to visit Jerusalem and all the places, we went to all of these points. And uh, there are now olive trees in this area. And there is this rock where Jesus prayed. So as we continue, because now Jesus is going to take his disciples, a couple of them to pray somewhere. So there is a church at the point where he took his disciples, the rock on which he bent over to pray to God. Okay, so coming back to the gospel. And he took with him. So he's saying that you all sit here and I will go and pray. He took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee. So the sons of Zebedee were James and John and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Now just transport yourself to the night before the crucifixion to, to feel what Jesus could have felt that night. That he loves so much the, the people of the world. He is so empathetic about them. He is so sorrowful about them. He has come to protect them, but he knows of what consequence is going to happen. And he knows that the, the game is now just a matter of few minutes. How heavy, how sad he is feeling. So he is also human at this point in time. And just try to feel what he would have felt. See, he, he felt very sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. So he asks those three people. So he's taken Peter, James and John with him. And he's, he's telling them the feeling of his heart, how heavy and sorrowful he is. And he says, you watch over here and, and we will pray. Wait here and pray with me. Inwardly watch with the intuitive eye of Christ consciousness that satanic delusion may not enter us unnoticed. Be vigilant with the sword of wisdom. Slay at sight any encroaching mental agent of evil. So that is what actually the metaphorical meaning of this is. When Jesus says to us, watch, means be alert. Be thou a yogi Arjuna. And a yogi is super alert and aware or what is happening in his mind, what is happening in his feelings, how he's able to control those thoughts and feelings. Is he a master or is he a slave? So Jesus is telling us, watch, always be watchful. Okay. Even with all the wisdom and self-control of his divine nature, the incarnate human nature of Jesus was yet temporarily tormented by the delusion of the fearsome trial of crucifixion he was to face. Jesus had to overcome the ego's body circumscribed human nature, the delusion at work in the dreadful events ahead of him, his attachment to his disciples and his love of serving those who sought his help, the natural human aversion to bodily suffering and lastly, the primal psychological fear accompanying the prospect of death. So yes, we have heard Master say that earlier, that even the great ones, the, when the moment of death comes, so it can take uh, even the great ones some uh, moment of anguish or agony or difficulty. But of course, they then accept it gracefully and they know that they have to cross over to the other side. So the same was happening for Jesus. And he knew that not only will he suffer, he also knew what would the fate of his disciples will be after he goes away. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. So for the first time in the whole scripture, Jesus is not addressing God formally, saying Abba, Abba, Father. And he is saying that if it is possible, please take away this pain from me. But still, it is, I will go with what you decide. I mean, thou will be done, thy will be done, not mine. So that, that feel the amount of surrender it would go into saying those words.
And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, he says again, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as if it was great drops of blood falling down to the ground. But even as he prayed to be spared from the tyrannical workings of cosmic delusion, Jesus recognized the promptings of inner weakness and immediately added, Nevertheless, let not my human will, fearful to meet the trial be granted, let your wisdom-guided divine will find fulfillment in my life. So this is a huge lesson for all of us. Whenever we are faced with any difficulty, the cross may be big or the cross may be small. We will all have to bear our crosses. And once we have to bear our cross, then this is what our attitude should be. That God, you have sent this cross to me. It is thy will that I carry this cross in life. And I know you are with me. And I surrender to thy will. And I, will, I am willing to do as, thou, as you wish. I am your child, I am your servant, I am your channel, I am your instrument. Do with me what thou willest. If we can keep such an attitude during difficult times, then the pain, or the emotional pain and the egoic mental pain that come with the suffering which is already there is not multiplied. Then we can act accept to an extent and acknowledge that okay this is the state of affairs this is the suffering in my life right now this suffering is sent to me by god to learn some lesson or cancel some past karma and i must go through it in an even-minded way till the point i can override this with my own energy and with the grace of god Jesus' example showed that man is to use his God-given freedom to consciously choose to exercise his will in seeking to fulfill the Lord's wishes on earth. By cooperation with the divine will, man permits into his life the ready and waiting inflow of God's wisdom, power, love and joy. The Gospel continues. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. And said unto Peter, What could ye not watch with me over one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So uh, after praying for some time, Jesus comes back to Peter, James and John and he finds that they are asleep. And he rebukes them and he scolds them. He says, you can't even watch for an hour. If you are so uh, reluctant to watch, then the evil of temptation, the delusion will catch upon you. So he is sad as well as he is angry at them and he tells them again to watch. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. In these words, Jesus signified that an evil impulse or Satan cannot force a person to yield to a wrong prompting. Enter not implies a free will act of rejecting temptation. Master now warns, he says, all devotees until final liberation is attained are occasionally subject to diverse temptations that impede progress toward God. Delusion may easily steal unnoticed into the mind influencing one's behavior consciously or subconsciously. Thus the devotee must always maintain a constant introspective watchfulness of his mental and emotional state and their subtle incitements to good or bad actions. The gospel continues. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So again, Jesus goes back to that rock. He falls down to his knees again. He is praying the same prayer to the Heavenly Father. 
And he says, if this cup cannot be taken from me and if I have to drink it, then I take it as thy will. So again, after the prayer, when he goes back to his disciples, again, the three of them, he finds them uh, sleeping. Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, behold, the hour is at hand and the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinner. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. So what is happening here? He finds them asleep again. He is He rebukes them again, but then he knows that the time has arrived and he says, now we have to go because the one who has betrayed me is at hand. He is coming. And while he yet spake, so as he is speaking these words, Judas came and with him a great multitude came with swords and staves from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he, hold him fast. So what happens is when Judas uh, brings the soldiers uh, to to the to Jesus and his disciples, the soldiers and scribes ask him, "How will we know that who is Jesus?" So Judas says, uh, "The one whom I will kiss, that will be Jesus." And forthwith, Judas came to Jesus and said, "Hail, Master!" and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, "Friend, wherefore art thou come?" So again, Jesus is still addressing Judas as friend. And as if in a casual conversation, he is asking from where you have come. Of course, Jesus knows everything, but still he calls his enemy his friend. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? So instead of waiting for others to ask, he himself goes to the uh, uh, people who have, the soldiers who have come, and he asked them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with him. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they were bent backward and fell into to the ground. So such was the power of the words that Jesus said, I am he, that the soldiers who had come, the people who had come to watch and to arrest him, they actually went back. Physically, they were pushed back in a sense. Then asked he again, so, the, so even though the soldiers had, of course, fallen to the ground, they would have stood up again. And then Jesus asked them again, whom? Seek ye, and they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go away. So he is still protecting his disciples, excuse me. <laughs> He's saying, I have told you that I am Jesus of Nazareth. So let these disciples, let the others go away. That the saying might be fulfilled which he spake, of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. So what is being fulfilled here? So Jesus has, if you remember a couple of you know, uh, verses back, Jesus is praying to the Father that thou has given me responsibility for these disciples and you must protect them. And he's also concerned for their welfare. So right now in this position, he's actually concerned and protecting their welfare when he says to the soldiers that you have come for me, I am that person, so please spare the lives and um, you know, of all the other people who are there. Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. So the soldiers have now come. They, have, they are holding Jesus now. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. So what is happening? A very dramatic event now happens. The soldiers have come to... Uh, collect Jesus. They are holding on to Jesus. Peter is, so although it is mentioned, the one who was with Jesus is actually in some other gospel, it says Peter. So Simon Peter comes, he is he takes off the sword from one of the soldiers and he cuts off the ear of that soldier. Then said Jesus unto him, 
Put up again thy sword into thy place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. So here Jesus gives that commandment where he says that violence will lead to violence. Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? So he says, rebuking his disciples, what do you think? And he's of course sending the message to the soldiers as well. What do you think? I can call upon the angels and they will save me. But then how will the scriptures be fulfilled? How will this whole drama play out? How will you know about Christ consciousness, cosmic consciousness and how God the Father is a loving, merciful God because eventually he knows he's going to resurrect from his flesh. So all of that drama, the scripture has to play out. The Messiah has to come. He has to be crucified with all the accompanying story. And therefore, Jesus is simply surrendering himself to fulfill the scripture. Okay. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched the ear and healed him. So what Jesus does to the soldier is, the soldier whose ear has fallen off actually, uh, it has been hit by a sword. So Jesus puts his hand on the uh, lost ear of the soldier and a, a new ear is supposed to have regenerated. So the soldier regains an ear uh, by the mercy and compassion of Jesus Christ. Of course, then Jesus, of course, uh, Master here is explaining that how hatred begets hatred. And uh, uh, we can maybe leave this discussion aside for now because we know about the number of wars that are uh, even currently happening across the world, across con continents, that only peace can bring a, a stop to war and a war will beget war, hatred will beget hatred, jealousy will beget jealousy. Unless there is the opposite movement of energy, unless there is love, unless there is the feeling of brotherhood, unless there is the feeling that we are one large family and that we are all brothers and sisters <coughs> or children of the same one God, till then we know that uh, the, the one who goes with the sword perishes with the sword. <clears throat> okay. The gospel continues. In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staffs for to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. So now, besides the soldiers, some servants have come, some other people have come to watch the drama of what is going to happen to Jesus. And he is addressing them, that all of you have come together as if you have come to catch a thief. And while I was teaching you in the temple, then you had no courage to lay hands upon me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. So Jesus knew that the karmically determined time had now arrived when he would submit himself to the spiritual test of the evil power of darkness. Then the drama continues. The gospel now says, then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And they had that had laid hold on Jesus, led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see till the end. So now when the servants have caught hold of Jesus, the disciples uh, they are afraid and they all run away from that place. Only Peter tries to follow Jesus as Jesus is being taken to Caiaphas, who is the head priest. Uh, Peter, from a distance, you know, hiding behind bushes and hiding behind people, he watches over Jesus and sees when Jesus is taken into the building and he is sitting outside with the servants to watch what is happening. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples, and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. So, of course, uh, the high priests have to confront Jesus and they're saying, they're asking him, What have you said? What are you doing? 
And what is all this that you claim? So he is saying that I have not hidden nothing in, in front of everybody. I have said openly, whatever I have said, I have said openly in synagogues and temples in front of all the people. Let them testify for my truth. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? So one of the officers comes and hits Jesus with his hand. And he says, answer is just as if, as if Jesus was that, you know, another, just another criminal, just another thief. And he says, answer is thou the high priest so. Jesus answered him. If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? So he is saying, if I have done anything evil, bring a witness and tell me what evil I have done. But if I have not done any evil, then why are you smiting me? Jesus had taught nothing but good. And he knew that the faithful ones who had heard him could speak of his teachings as solely beneficial. He preferred that the high priest receive their testimony rather than defend his teachings himself. <clears throat> Jesus, like God, behaved with humility and meekly submitted his great self to the tyranny of a few wicked people. As God, though all-powerful, does not raise his hand in wrath to punish anybody who blasphemes him, so he expects a faithful devotee to behave like him. The Gospel continues. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it what these witnesses are saying against thee? So uh, if you remember in the gospel, we had studied that how when Jesus came to the temple, when he uh, had overthrown the money lender, money exchangers and the lenders and the, uh, and the people in the marketplace. And that is the time he had said that if you bring down this temple, I will raise it in three days. And actually he had meant his bodily temple, which no none had understood. So, so far the scribes and Pharisees are, they are collecting people who would witness against Jesus and they find none except for finally the, these two people come who gave, who, who testify and says this is what he had said. So now is the time the scribes will find that, you know, the last straw on the camel's back, which will break the, which will change the entire scene. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it? which these witnesses are saying against thee. But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. So it's now directly being asked, is he the Christ, is he the Son of God? Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So now, instead of Jesus saying that he is the Son of God and he is the Christ, the drama being played out is that the scribe or the minister is asking him, are you Christ? Are you the Son of God? So uh, if, if we see, you know, history being written and metaphorically, Jesus finally did not have to declare and he did not say from his mouth that he was the Christ. But he made the other person ask him so that it was the truth was expressed and was noted finally in the scripture and for us to read. Jesus, in a remarkably selfless way, confirms to his enemy his true self by letting them declare it. After the drama of this bodily existence is over, the Son of Man, my body after resurrection, will be beheld in astral world by advanced devotees as manifestation of Christ consciousness. All those who are able to perceive through their self 
e eye of wisdom. So I have uh, noted the question that has been put on the chat box. We will answer that at the end of the class. Okay. All those who are able to perceive through their uh, eye of wisdom will see my Christ saturated body manifest in a vision sitting on the right hand of the power of God. The projection of myself in an astral body ensconced in meditative ecstasy. The vision will appear to the devotee as though coming out of the dark clouds of closed eyes, which therefore has hidden the glory of the realms of heaven. In these verses, right hand signifies the principal working power. So Christ consciousness is a pure reflection of cosmic consciousness, the only power. Also the Kutastha Chaitanya, same as the Kutastha Chaitanya, just a different name, is the only power, the only intelligence that runs the universe. Jesus also signified that not only will people be able to feel him through the comforter or through the Holy Spirit, but people who are in tune, souls who are lovingly in tune with Christ consciousness will also be able to see the form of Jesus. Those who ever call upon him with that love, with that yearning and earnestness will be able to, uh, see, to see the form of Jesus Christ. So I think that is true for many people, uh, uh, many people who are present here also have felt the presence of Christ in their life, whether in form or whether in the formless Christ, whether in the form of a raisined, of an in, uh, increase or raisined energy in the astral spine or whether in the form of an expanding love in the heart or just as a presence of deep Christ peace in meditation. All of us present here can testify to whatever degree that we have felt the love, the peace, the power, the presence of Christ in one way or the other to one degree or to another. And that is what he's saying. And if you really call upon him, you will be able to see Christ as you want. So God manifests to the devotee lovingly the way devotee wants uh, to see God. That is also another parallel truth. So uh, although we do not keep demands on how God should present to us and Master has taught us to be open to uh, whatever uh, grace God sends to us, but if uh, still we have that personal yearning to see the personal Jesus as he was, then if we pray ardently, if we meditate deeply, then that vision shall be granted to us and that has been promised in the scripture. Okay, the gospel now continues. So now let's just go back to the drama that is happening in that room where Caiaphas is there, the soldiers are there, the ministers are there, high priests are there, people have gathered. The soldier has even hit Jesus uh, once and Jesus is in a, you know, he's, he cannot move physically, he's unable to move and he's standing there with his head down in all humility. Then the high priest rent his clothes saying, he had spoken blasphemy. So the priest comes and he tears off the clothes on the body of Jesus and he says, you have spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? So now this was the, the fact that the witnesses have said that uh, he, he said that he will break down the temple and will raise it again. And now he is saying that I will be on the right hand of God. So the scribes and priests, you know, they are, it's easy for them to now declare that this is blasphemous an act and that he must be punished. They answered and said, he is guilty of death. Then did they spit on his face and buffeted him. And others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophecy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee. So there is Jesus. He's being hit by hands. His clothes are being torn. People are spitting on his face. It's, this, is, this is so overwhelming. I'm, the first time, actually, I can. I'm just sharing you my personal experience. Every time I go through this, it's I find it very difficult to digest. The first time I saw the whole movie of Jesus of Nazareth, and the point where this starts to happen, and he was being crucified, it took me. It took me many hours of sorrow and tears to get over the fact why this was happening to him. 
it is so difficult to digest the think of the avatar who has come to save you who has given you all the love that is possible in the universe and he has come to personally guide you and then this is what is happening to him who are we little mortals you know it is so difficult to digest now peter sat without the palace so outside the palace we remember peter sit is sitting with the servants and a damsel came unto him saying thou also was with jesus of galilee but he denied before them all saying i know not what thou sayest and when he was gone out into the porch another maid saw him and said unto him that were there this fellow was also with jesus of nazareth and again he denied with an oath i do not know the man and after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to peter surely thou also art one of them for thy speech betrayeth thee then began he to curse and swear saying i know not the man and immediately the cock crew and peter remembered the word of jesus which said unto him before the cock crows thou shalt deny me thrice and he went out and wept bitterly this human drama where uh, peter does love jesus it's not that peter doesn't love jesus but here again comes the play of delusion the play of ego where it the ego makes you feel that your own body and your own preservation is important is so important that you can deny uh, even the truth that is standing in front of you this is how helpless humans are because we under the sway of delusion and uh, exactly when so three people come to uh, peter and three of them say that you were with jesus of nazareth and three times he says i do not know the man the first time he says plainly the second time he takes an oath that he doesn't know the man and the third time you know like offense is the best defense he starts to be angry and cursing at the people denying again and saying that i do not know the man and then the cock crows now if you if you were in place of peter it was quite a probability would have we would have done the same thing it's so this is the human and the divine drama that continues to play in our life even though in his hour of trial jesus was abandoned by peter and the other disciples most of them later repented of their weaknesses and atoned for their sin strengthened in their recollected realization of the grace and blessing jesus had bestowed on them they regained their faith and courage so uh, the message here is that even if there is a moment of weakness so even sometimes if if we also uh, move towards worldly means to protect ourselves so so somebody is saying that oh you have a guru and that person is speculative about the guru and you say no 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 i'm just following i'm just doing some meditation i'm not really following so something like this some denial like this at some subtle level can happen in front of some people but then uh, we know in our hearts that it is it is not the right thing because we must stand by the truth whatever it may be however difficult it may be but then if we go forward suppose such a thing happens instead of feeling guilty and instead of feeling ashamed if we go back into our faith and if we go back into reconciliation with our own soul and we go back into faith and prayer deeply then the reconciliation can happen and you can still feel the presence of god because god is all loving god is ever compassionate he is our very own tradition holds that peter who was eventually killed for preaching christ's truth asked his persecutors to crucify him with his head down and his feet up for his sin in having thrice denied christ when as jesus had predicted peter fell temporarily under the influence of satanic delusion okay. i think we should be ending the class here today and let us take a moment to close our eyes and to feel uh, the the not only the scene but the agony of jesus the agony of the disciples the agony of the in, of entire mankind at having denied the avatar at not recognizing so even now the truth is right here christ consciousness is right within us and around us and 
every atom of existence, there is the hidden Christ intelligence. And even now we are denying its presence. We are still saying, I am this body and I like this to live in this world and I want to be attached to this world and I want to have these desires and I want these little fulfillment. So in truth, on a daily basis, we are denying that we know Christ. We are denying that we are made of Christ's substance. We are denying the truth on a daily basis. That is the sorry state of the limited human mortal. And this can be corrected by regular, faith, regular prayer, by faith, by meditation, because by three, these agencies, we can come in contact with the ever-present Christ within us. And once we can testify in ourself that uh, we, we are made of Christ's substance, then we will not be denying him. That is the only way out of delusion. The way out of delusion is not into the world. The way out of delusion is inside us. That is the way, the truth, the spirit of Christ. And we must all therefore turn inwards and find our God, our beloved Jesus sitting there within our own self, our own heart and at our own spiritual eye. With that thought, we'll end today's class and we will share the blessings and the love and the power that we have received to all souls everywhere. Let us pray together. Divine Mother, blessed Jesus Christ, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in all bodies, all minds, and all souls. Oh. 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 Divine Mother, beloved Jesus Christ, may thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of our devotion and may we be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti.